Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. This is webinar number 72 that I have been running since the pandemic started. Um, what I try to do is present interesting ideas and information about horses from a, a more scientific base so that we can have a better understanding of our horses. But then sometimes we just have to go with the experience and see what happens because we don't always have data to back up what we're doing. And that's certainly true of Surefoot. When I started Surefoot, I had no idea what was going to happen. And in 15 seconds, it changed my life when that horse walked off the pad sound. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly how Surefoot's working. And while we don't have data at this point, we certainly have a lot of really big clues. It's one of the reasons I'm doing the webinars is to help us understand what may be happening when horses are on surefoot pads. And yesterday's webinar with Deb Davies talked about proprioception. Um, it's clear that surefoot is affecting proprioception. And this is a really important thing because proprioception tells us where we are in space. And there's a variety of receptors that send information to the brain, which then will send messages back to the muscles so that we can coordinate this body and organize ourselves in movement and in space. Um, that said, today is a very applied uh, webinar. We're gonna be talking with Bess Miller. She has been a breeder of ponies for quite a number of years, and she started using the Surefoot pads with foals. So when you think about the importance of proprioception and knowing where your body is in space so that you can be a, a really solid citizen and really confident later on, um, this is going to be a really interesting webinar because Bess is going to talk about starting horses out with Surefoot. So thank you so much, Bess, for joining us today. It's such a pleasure. Um, I haven't seen you in a long time. Um, no. It feels like <laughs> forever. We um, spent two years, like, monthly with each other. <laughs> I know, and then she started to build a house, so she disappeared, and I don't blame her, but that's it's been a while. So Bess, um, give us a bit of your background and, and, and your involvement with ponies, because I know you've been involved with breeding ponies for a very long time. Yeah, so my family, um, we're one of the oldest Shetland pony breeders in the country. Um, in the late 90s, we still had over 200 broodmares and four stallions. Um, I am not really breeding for production anymore. I'm pretty much breeding for myself. Um, I do sell a foal here and there, um, but I definitely don't ever want to have 200 plus have any kind of animal ever again. <laughs> Even though they're small, I can't imagine 200, you know, running around. I'm, I'm sure if you had a breakout, it must have been hysterical. <laughs> well, we, we never did have a breakout. I mean, we had one where we had some disgruntled employees that opened up all the gates and all the stallions got together and had a huge fight and all the mares got mixed up. That was not good. But um, that's about the only serious drama. <laughs> that's a pretty good record. <laughs> Our ponies, we um, we bred them mostly for sport horse type um, use and um, mixed them with our, we also breed Arabians, um, did half Arabian, half Shetlands, and um, did sport ponies with those. Um, and, and so I, I have a selection of different sizes left at this point. Um, and the two, the two that I chose for you to look at today um, uh, is they're right now one and two years old. And so- um, But you I mean, also, been, just so people understand a bit more of your background, you have a very deep background in working with horses besides the breeding. Oh yeah, yeah. So I started out on the hunter jumper circuit as a kid riding ponies and, um, up through, I think I finished with my last pony when I was about 16. And then I moved into um, combined training, which um, it's just, it, it wasn't my thing, but I discovered dressage through combined training and um, was very heavily into dressage for 20 years. Um, and then I got married and moved to Wisconsin, and that's where I discovered um, Robin Hood was up teaching clinics every six months in Wisconsin and Il northern Illinois. And um, so I spent a couple of years going to every single long training I could with Robin. And, um, and that's I, the uh, Jones Equine Awareness yeah. Center. Yep. Yeah. And um, I had always done centered riding with Sally Swift since I was I don't know, 13 or 14 years old, but um, I was very lucky 
um, my mom and my grandfather did get me to really good people to take lessons and kept me going to clinics and things like that. So I do have a, I have kind of a, uh, yeah, deep background in a lot of different um, modalities for teaching and becoming a better rider, but also um, working with all the different ponies. So Shetland ponies, we also had Welsh ponies, the Arabians, the crosses. Um, I've had thoroughbred Arabian crosses, warm blood Arabian crosses. And in the last 10 years um, for my lesson program, I started buying um, quarter horses. And so now I'm working a lot. I really like the quarter horses too. They're completely different than the Arabians and di yeah. way different to train. And <laughs> it's a whole new skill set. So I went, I did get involved with natural horsemanship people, um, especially Richard Trake with the quarter horses. And um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a different thing. <laughs> well, and you also spent time on the show jumper circuit, right? As a groom. Yes. Yeah. I've been a groom. I'm a really good groom <laughs> to this day. <laughs> well, my point being, you know, but not in addition to the breeding, you have a very deep background in horses and many different aspects and enhance. So you've handled a lot of horses and different breeds over uh, your lifetime. actually. Yeah. And I should mention I'm tiny. So learning how to handle horses safely without having to have a lot of muscle has been like a key thing with me. And the, with training the horses with the sure foot pads has just made my life so much easier. They just, they, uh, especially with these latest two, um, they just retain information. There's less resistance. There's, it's just, it's just this Surefoot has been the biggest um, like leap forward as a trainer for me um, to make my life easier. Wow, that's that's quite a statement, uh, actually. Um, yeah. So, um, in, if you were to say what's the one thing that that it's done to make your life easier, what would that be? Well, I mean, I, I actually, I, there's two main things that I really wanted to emphasize, um, especially um, that long video. I don't know if we can, I don't know how we can like show it, but of the, the yearling that I'm working with, um, they retain information better. And when I say information, I mean the questions you're presenting them with as you're training a young horse. So like a yearling or a two-year-old. Um, you, you know, my experience is you either have to kind of put them in a position to get them to sort of have a response, whether it's positive or negative. Um, but with the sure foot pad, they steer themselves to the positive response without you having to keep, you know, representing the question. And um, I think you'll see at that if we do have time to do that at the end, um, where she's learning to walk over um, a bridge. Um, I really I don't have to I don't have to do a lot. I kind of change the question, but you know she basically figures it out on her own. And we really pushed it time wise because we were trying to keep that video short, and it's in under ten minutes. So, um, and then you know the other thing the other thing that I just really like is. Um, I actually, yesterday I had a pony come in with a huge abscess on her wither, which I've never had ever in my career. Like my goats have lots of abscesses, but I've actually never had a horse have an abscess. <laughs> and it was nasty and I had to lance it, but I put her on sure foot pads first before I started fussing with her. And it just kind of got her into a chill thinking, trying to cooperate state. And it's the same thing with the training. If you are using the sure foot pads before your training session, during your training session, um, even after, if they've had kind of a stressful learning experience, pop them on the sure foot pads, they shake it off quicker, they come back not in a, um, you know, stressed, like, oh no, not this again. It's kind of like, oh wait, what are we doing? Like, I think I have a better answer for that this time. So. I, I call it critical thinking. I, I know that people will disagree with me that horses can be critical thinkers, but um, I, I really do feel that it puts them in um, a state where they're able to analyze the situation and answer the question that you're presenting better. Well, I, I don't know that I would disagree with the word critical thinking, but I think 
from listening to you, and this is, I, I mean, we haven't talked about this, so I'm like blown away. No. <laughs> um, and, um, but you know, horses feel stress and horses need to feel safe. And I, and I know that one of the number one things surefoot pads do for horses is make them feel safe. So if, if safety is associated with critical thinking, in other words, if you feel safe, you're able to think, then I think your statement's valid. Um, and it always goes back to my thought of so many horses, I think, are way more stressed than we acknowledge that they're Correct. in some state of slushy freeze, you know, shutdown, or some state of anxiety. And they're very, uh, you know, the number of horses that are actually in, for lack of a better word, a neutral place, a secure, inquisitive place where they can evaluate is, is uh, you know, not, they're either, they tend to be shut down or um, overexcited, you know, and sympathetic. Right. And so, you know, it may be that, and I'm just throwing this out there to see if it sticks, that um, when the horses are feeling that degree of safety and grounded security, then they can think and therefore they are becoming better thinkers and right. processes. Well, and I think too, one of the things, you know, that I've, I've talked to you about this before, about doing the surefoot with my, my young rider students, um, it makes them a better observer of, um, you know, the clues that the horses are giving us to, to where can they you, are. Can you talk about what you did there a little bit? Because I know it's a little off topic from the foals, but they are foals. Uh, <laughs> they're kids. And, and I thought that was, it was so fascinating. So just take a minute to talk about what you did okay. with the students. So what, what was this maybe two, I think I had the actual first set of pads, like, cause my, I, so that's the other thing in the video, not all my pads are the right colors because <laughs> I took a lot of your prototype pads. <laughs> but um, so the kids, um, what I did was I just wanted to experiment with how hard or easy is it to teach someone to put a horse on a pad because this was two or three years ago when we were sort of experimenting with how to get humans to teach their horses to put them on the pads. And um, so the kids were doing it and I had developed a short list of body clues, things to watch to see if the pads are affecting change with the horse that you're working with. And so I made it really simple. I gave the kids five things to look for, which I can't remember what they were. I think they were the nose, the muzzle changes, blinking, um, swaying. They were like really, the really obvious things, um, lowering of the head, um, just five things for them to watch for. And what I had been having trouble with um, for the last like five to 10 years is kids grooming um, in an unobserved way, if I can kind of say it that way. They're not paying attention to when horses are uncomfortable with how hard they're currying or they don't like having their mane brush, you know, roughly or, you know, things like that. And especially with like girthing, they're not paying attention to they're doing it too fast, too hard and horses are laying ears back and things like that. And I, this one group of three girls that I worked with on the pads, they, they were my worst offenders of, you know, having to constantly remind them when they were grooming, please don't do that. Do you see how she's making a face? Do you see how, you know, it was an obvious thing that the horses were uncomfortable with, but I could not get the kids to clue in on it. So we had one session with these three girls learning how to put their separate whatever they were, lesson horse or one of my training horses or whatever on pads and didn't expect, you know, I just wanted them to see what they could see, if they could see a change. And they picked out a few things and all three of them in their next lesson became better groomers. <laughs> and they all said to me, oh, she's raising her head. That means she doesn't like this. And I was like, okay, good. Like, I don't know if that's what it means, but I'm glad you observed that change in the horse. And it, they observed it before the ears went back. So as a trainer, the thing that I've also learned with the surefoot pads is I'm able to recognize when the horse is starting to, I call it, ask a question. Like, why am I doing this? What is she expecting me to do? Can it be slowed down? Like you know, I, I just, I think it makes you a better trainer to have these sure foot pads. You, you're way more tuned into the horse, if you want to put it that way. 
but it's it's stunning that one short session with these three girls completely changed how they interacted with the horses. Yeah. And yeah, and it's one short session too, like with these foals that we're gonna talk about today. Um, you know, especially like Violet, the first one after that first <laughs> clinic, I, had, I literally had just the physio pads. Um, it, you know, it was like maybe less than 30 seconds of being on the pads like two or three times and it changed her whole um, way how she reacts to stimulus, you know? So I think it works for humans and horses, personally. <laughs> yeah, and you know, we've had people uh, randomly place horses on pads. Um, uh, you know, like uh, somebody sent me a picture of her son and they had had a foal and he was already in there put, putting the foal on a pad. And I worked with a, I think it was a yearling. But you know, again, it's if you're not in that population, if you don't have a herd to work with, it's right. hard to get some data. It's hard to see some consistency in terms of what, what happens over time. And so that's one of the beauties that you have a small number of foals that you can take the time to kind of document what's going on and look at that. Um, and so um, let me just get Violet up here. I'm trying to figure out which, uh, let's see, where's what is the first picture I'm looking for? Well, I'm just going to oh, oh, come back to your file. I'm gonna, I'll start with this one. Um, okay. But you can guide me if this is not the right order of things. So Bess has sent me her pictures because um, they're not on the computer that she's. And I'm terrible with technology. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I'm really good with horses. <laughs> struggle a little bit with the order of things. I, I tried to put them in an order. Um, but we transfer did not send them to us in the order that it should, you know. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So. So this is this is Violet, and um, what I did, I mean, this was a total experiment. I had no idea how to approach this. Um, I think we had done um, like maybe it was it was a riding clinic, but we'd thrown my quarter horse mare on pads real quick because I had bought the original human pads that you were using in the beginning. And I had worked with a couple of training horses with those and then having the different assortment of pads with that quarter horse mare, like I was like, oh, I have to have as many of these pads as she has with her. So um, I had the physio pads and I think I had the purple pads in the pods is what I came home with. And so um, this full, um, she was born in the field and this mare has these huge babies. And so you can't really pick them up and carry them back to the barn. Like you have to kind of manhandle them a little bit to get them to follow their mom. And, um, she, she always does this thing where we're like, oh, you're fine. You don't, aren't showing any signs. We'll let it go another day. And then you come back at lunch and there's a baby on the ground. <laughs> so, so she, kind of surprised us. And so this baby, um, she was really reactive. Um, if you touched her, she would sort of explode. Um, she didn't like having flies on her. She was constantly headbutting her mom um, and not nursing. I mean, she was nursing, but she was just like, that was her go-to thing was just to go up to her mom and just slam her in the udder. Um, she just seemed really restless. So um, and, and you've had enough foals to know that, like, how many foals have you ever had with this type of behavior in your, in all of your years of breeding? I mean, I think I figured out that I've had 800 plus foals. So, um, I, I don't, I don't, because they change so much, um, birth to five years, their personality, like, you can think, oh, this one is going to be not appropriate for children. And by the time it, it's a three-year-old, you're like, oh, this is my best kid's pony. So I try not to assign, you know, I just kind of, I think I've always been sort of a noticer, which is why I've done well with the surefoot pads. I don't really assign meaning to a lot of the stuff because it's so much changes. Um, but like, I kind of knew that Violet was going to be a little bit more difficult with halter breaking because she was already throwing her head around and frustrated with things. And um, I, I just, I felt like she was going to be a more reactive pony. 
Um, she is extremely smart. Um, so she's a two-year-old now. She can open snaps. She can untie double knots. She, she is busy. <laughs> We keep her, she is the only pony out with some giant horses, and she thinks she's one of those big horses. I mean, she is, those horses, she's out there to learn to not be so full of herself, and they're not doing a good job. Because oh. <laughs> she bosses all those big horses around. <laughs> so, so this is already, uh, let me, let me stop my screen share and then go back to my pictures here. Um, and the, so the one I'm going to go to is the file uh, with the first experiment. Yep. Okay. So let me just um, open all of these. So I have and I also, I work alone a lot. So getting pictures and videos is really hard for me because I can't set it up somewhere and like walk away and have babies or horses standing in the same place. So sorry that some of these pictures they're blurry. I was just like trying to quickly get things. It's great that you've got anything, right? Because, you know, when you're working with a foal and you've got a mare and everything, it, there's a lot. Yeah. Of well, in this mare, she's, she doesn't care. Like she's, she's one of my lesson ponies. And so she's like completely comfortable with me. Hand, like she's never nervous or that's great. Um, um, aggressive. Um, but this, so what I try to do, I like the big farrier pad, you know, the, the bigger rectangle one. I have the small one and I have the big one. And for the pony foals, it works out really well because it's about the length is about where they would stand normally. So I just put it up against a wall and then I just kind of guide the baby onto the pad and she rotated herself. This is, I think, the first or second try. She just rotated herself so just her back feet were on the pad. And I don't try to hold them there. Sometimes they're on for literally two seconds and you'll get a lick in it. Um, I think she was five days old. And it, what's interesting is that you can see her ear, or is her cock, like, it's like she's listening. Right. Well, and so the most fascinating thing to me with the foals on the pads is whether they're, sometimes they'll stand on it a little bit longer. I've never had one stand on it more than maybe 20 to 30 seconds, but as soon as they come off, they go right to their mom and nurse, which to me is grazing response for a foal. And so um, when you're working with the foals, I think you and you don't see a lot of um, puffy breaths. You might see that, but I don't see a lot of the same body clues that we see with the older horses on the pads. Um, here's where, so I have them lined up so that, cause she was kind of getting half on, half off. And so I just thought, well, maybe if I make it a little bit longer then um, she'll stay on it, which she did. Um, and, and you, you can, just, can you describe how you guide them onto the pad because I know that you know it's really important for you, people to understand that you're not placing her on the pad. Or Correct. So that's why I have it against the wall and in a corner because I can kind of just with you know like how you walk. I should also note I don't put halters on any of my. The Arabians might get halters at three weeks old. The ponies don't get halters for like four to six months. I don't like they just pull. It teaches, it's a lot of, for me, it's just a lot of bad stuff. So they have to learn right away that I can handle them, you know, without putting halters on them. So um, usually I just kind of, you know, I have a hand on a chest and hand on the butt and guide them onto the pad. Now, what was interesting with Violet was because she was so skin sensitive and reactive to touch, she was a little bit explosive to get her over to the pad. And after the first time being on the pads, that was when I noticed what I call this critical thinking, where she was like, wait, what is she trying to get me to do? And she was less explosive, less and more easy to manipulate onto the pads. And in that first session, what I did was um, I let her um, be on the pads for like one or two quick little, and I think she was maybe 10 seconds each time on the pads. And then she would lay down. She would nurse and then lay down. And she was really annoyed with the flies that day. Um, 
and we did like three sessions over the morning while I was working horses where I'd put her on the pads twice and then she'd crash out and take this deep nap. But she crashed out and stopped reacting to the flies. That was, that was when I knew like, oh, this is changing something in these babies because she's not twitching. She's not lifting her head up constantly while she's laying down. She just couldn't seem to rest because she was so like, bothered. I don't, I don't know how to, how else to explain it, but, um, she would finally just rest. And so, um, that was when I knew it was okay to use them with the foals and, um, that it wasn't going to have a negative, you know, I'm always worried about overstimulating babies. So right. here you can see, like, she walked off, but she left a hind foot on. So I don't try to, I just let them do what they want to do, basically, the babies. Right. Well, and I mean, that's sort of the same approach that we do with the big horses, too, is that not to force them, let them walk off. You know, not, it's not something you're making them do or training them to do. It's something that you're offering the possibility. And then so much of it is observing, right, as you right. said. And um, what, what happens there? And let me just go to the next one. I'm, I'm not sure which one. Let's see, that was... Uh, do that one, that one, have you seen this one? No. Um, yeah, it's just another view of her. Yep. Um, so, so by the time I could get far enough back, you know, to take a picture, she would pretty consistently rotate off the pads with her front feet, but she'd leave her back feet. So she really liked the back feet, like yeah. the operative word, um, chose to leave her back feet on. And again, just looking at her face here, you can see a, con a, a contemplative type of a look that, right. you know, as you say, that to be able to get far enough back to take a picture means that she was choosing to stay there for several seconds long enough for you to do this. Right. And so in the first, uh, week, how how many times do you think you worked with her on the pads? Well, I know I did three days, and so like I work horses in the morning, so I would pro I think you know I um, I did like as I said like the two placing her on the pads and whether she stayed on two seconds or ten seconds or whatever, then I would leave and go work a horse and then come back, and I know I did three days. And um, by the end of the first week, like she was really easy to guide around the stall. Like if I put a little right hand pressure on her, she'd move to the left. It was, it was like I had just done a whole training session on applying pressure to move front feet and back feet. And um, it, made, it made getting her to and from their little paddock a whole lot easier. And it made her sort of um, bond up with her mom a little bit better. Um, Violet was also, she was one that she just, and she, she didn't, I mean, continuing on into her yearling, weanling, yearling year, she, she would separate off from her mom and get lost, and <laughs> she's, she's kind of an oddball, <laughs> but, but she, you know, she's, she's very, she was very easy to handle as a baby, easy to halt or break, um, and I didn't think that would be the case, and whether that surefoot or, you know, all these, I do do a lot of different, you know, training stuff with them, which you'll see in the, the next few pictures, because she was flippy with her head. But so I, I'm curious about the up. fact that, so you would do a, do a short session. How long do you think that session would last? Oh, so, last two minutes. Two minutes. And then you would go and she would crash out and take a nap. Um, and then you'd come back and just visit again. Yep. I know I have a picture where she was napping. I know you sent me one of those. It should have been in the last oh. picture of that first file, the experiment file. Yep, got it. Um, just, I, thought, I just think it's a cute picture. Yeah. And so how think, old is she at this point? That's still five days old. This is that first session. Do you see her mom has backed up onto the pads? <laughs> Oh, you're right. <laughs> Bridget loves the pads. <laughs> That's really fun. Have you, I know that some people have, have you ever put a pregnant mare on pads? Um, I mean, I feel like I probably have. I, I. But you didn't intentionally 
do that. Yeah, I, I mean, so for me, the pads are a daily use thing. I use them on somebody every day. And um, the pony that had the abscess, she's 24. I had never had her on pads before, um, but I knew because I was by myself, I needed to do a little minor surgery to lance open this abscess and drain it. I knew I wouldn't be able to do it easily if I didn't put her on the pads first. So I just, you know, like so you that's what we have with you didn't because I know one uh, person that was actually at that clinic at Kathy Glues um, who had a pregnant mare and she put the mare on pads and she said that the foal kind of rolled around a bit, but the mare loved it. You yeah. Know? So, I've had people ask me that question and I, you know, it's always up to the horse whether or not they stay. Right. Um, and so, you know, I would think that the relaxation that we see would be good for, for some of these pregnant mares that I'm sure it's, you know, a lot of work carrying around an almost full term baby. Um, yeah. Um, well, and I mean, Bridget, so she's five days postpartum, you know, having her full, right. And, um, I think she, I mean, I just left the pads in there because I was, that day I was trying to like put the baby on and off, you know, several times. So she, she just took advantage of them. So you did about, I think you said three sessions a day, really yeah. short, maybe two minutes, um, maybe just a few seconds at a time with the full on the pad. She'd lay down, take a big nap, and then you'd come back and repeat a little while later. Yep. Yeah, that first week, because we were just trying to, you know, that was when we started documenting as much as we could every horse that we put on pads. Um, I kind of had a plan, you know, like we're going to, I'm just going to hammer this out and see what happens with this. Now I'm not so regimented. I'll, I kind of, um, like with the, this, the, with QP, the other one that we're going to show, um, I've done, I did way less than I have with Violet with the same results like it, it really it's not you can do it one time for five seconds and come back the next day and you will have better results like your full will be better wow and so how quickly did the skin sensitivity go away the, to the flies oh like after the second time on the pads like that day the first day um, it was when, I mean, so you can kind of see how she's sleeping sort of stretched out and her head is down in the straw. How she would sleep before was sitting up and put her nose down in the straw and then just wiggle, wiggle, wiggle her skin and flip her tail. And, um, and that was the first time I'd really seen her kind of crash out and stretch out and really relax. Wow. Wow. So, you know, it's just so interesting because in light of last night's um, webinar where we were talking about all these proprioceptors, they're Ruffini, Piscinian, mechanoreceptors, you know, um, the, and there was the, I think it was um, Mesner's, you know, that are just underneath the surface and that are sensitive to flies, right? Right. Um, and so, even though it was only her feet on the pads, there seems, seems like some kind of feedback loop that calmed all of those uh, receptors so that she could rest. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, in hindsight, I mean, she's definitely, um, I mean, she's an ADD pony. Do you know what I mean? She's busy. She's always trying to figure out, like, you know, she runs everywhere she goes. She likes to jump things, like, She's in the pasture looking for things to jump, looking for things to do, looking for things to make. How do I get the horses to play with me? Like, you know, um, she's just busy. And um, I think, I, but now she's not reactive busy. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. Like, Instead I think she would have been really a difficult. A stress <laughs> response with an anxiety level, she's just, she's, um, more grounded and just the curiosity comes out as opposed to the right. anxiety associated with curiosity. Yeah, it's she's busy instead of being anxious. Right. Um, and I don't know if this is the first day still or not. Like, yeah, said, this is still this is that group of first day. The next one the is like a like I think a month later or two couple months later and she has her head wrapped. Oh yeah. There we go. 
Oh, so this is something else that I do. Um, when, once you're able, so I teach the babies to pick their feet up starting about week three or four, no halter, usually in a stall, I'll just go and start picking up feet. And we actually will do their first trims um, with just me holding the baby. And so I do use a body bandage for that. And um, so this same summer that I'd been working with you, I did a clinic, uh, either with, with Linda or with, um, the, I'm sorry, I'm blanking the woman in Canada. Um, oh, Edie, Edie Jane. Edie Jane. Um, and we did a lot of body wraps and I learned how to wrap the head. So <laughs> poor Violet <laughs> decided yeah, to wrap I mean, her there's, head. there's, there's good rationale about doing this. I mean, uh, so for anybody who's really interested in learning more about body wraps, I did a webinar with Robin Hood. It's called All Wrapped Up. You can find it on my YouTube channel. Um, but there's also the whole, everything that we're learning, like with Temple Grandin and how that oh, um, contact really helped her. And so that the, this is affecting the proprioception and outlining where the body is in space. And there's something calming about that head wrap that I, you know, I've experienced using it with horses as well. Um, and so, you know, this makes sense to me that you would combine this with, you know, working with this baby. Well, and so, so at, I don't know if this was the day I was picking up her feet, but as soon as I can start picking up their feet without a huge struggle, then I'll throw another pad under there um, instead of the physio pad. And I, I know that Back when we were working with Violet, I think I'm, I had ordered, the only pads I could take home with me were the physios and this um, purple pad and the pods. So that was the only pad that I had. And so what I'll do is, um, I like to do it when they're nursing because they stay still. <laughs> For, I mean, they'll step off of it if they don't want it, but they'll, they'll, they're actually like engaged in something else and they don't fuss with me too much and so that's just one of the ways I introduce the single pad without you know too much disagreement or you know having to sometimes well, baby look it. back on you. We're talking about a, a thicker pad and obviously on straw it's a little bit more on level um, and as you say they're not they're not forced in any way to stay there so right. why not? You know, I I think and I just don't want them to pull back against me that's the main thing like when you're teaching foals to pick up their feet a lot of times you know you'll get a uh, they'll actually pull like extend their leg out and pull back mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. I just have learned that if they're nursing it's an easier time to teach them to pick up their feet because they don't do that pull back thing so I just threw a pad on going forward <laughs> Um, but you know, but what a great idea to to use use where they're already going. They're already coming forward to nurse, and at the same time, picking up their feet and offering them something like a surefoot pad. So you're you're giving them a benefit that they already recognize for picking up their foot. Right. You know. So I mean, it just looks like a win-win, um, as opposed to making a big. I know there's another one of those pictures. I think it's this one, um, it, you know, not making a big deal. I think that's, it's a similar picture or the same picture. Um, but, you know, in, in, like a little bit of distraction because she's busy nursing, but at the same time, she already knows what the pads are like in general. So um, that yeah. makes sense to me. All right. So do we have any more on Violet? Let me see here. I think- Oh, it might skip to Cupy newborn. Yep. Okay. I have tons of violet yearling pictures, but I didn't think they'd be super helpful because they're just photos. I couldn't get a lot of videos. All right. So let me open these. No, wait, not that one. This one. I'll start with this one. Oh, it's a little video. So before I play the video, tell us a little so, bit about. So this is, she's already been on the physio pads at this point. She's, uh, I think this is October and she was born in June. She had a reaction to her vaccinations and all her fur fell out. <laughs> oh. So she, this is the beginning of her fur falling out, which is why she looks so ratty. But um, I ended up having a clipper because it just like matted and um, it was, 
and I don't know what happened. I haven't done her vaccinations yet this year. I'm terrified. She didn't have a reaction to her booster, but this initial vaccination, she lost all of her fur. But um, she's on, can you make it scroll down? Cause she's on, I think she's on the blue pad. Yeah. Use the size on it a little bit. Or let me go back, should I go back to the still pictures of her first? Yeah, on the physio. Yeah, let me let me find. I thought it. I had a. Oh, is this a picture or a video? That was a video. Oh, here's the pic. Oh, here's the pictures. Hang on. <laughs> I messed up my numbers. That's okay. Uh, let me stop share and reshare because I never know how this thing. <laughs> now she's tiny. This is um. Uh, she's actually out of um two of my Shetland ponies that are also in the miniature registry, whatever. I don't, I don't actually do that, but um, they happen to be double registered. So she's teeny tiny. This is the little sure foot, or physio pad. This is the half physio pad? She's, she's teeny. She's really tiny. That's, the half physio pad is six bigger now. <laughs> but but she was like, this has gotta be the full physio because you can't tell the difference without relative yeah. perspective. And she's really. I'm pretty sure this is the tiny pad because I was like, "Oh my god!" Wow. And so, so how, how old is she here? Uh, like maybe two or three days. So she, um, her mother. I'll just give you a quick background on her. Her mother is one of my Cushing ponies, and had not had a foal in 12 years, and had been living with my elderly stallion as his best friend because she could not get pregnant. And um, <laughs> yes. and so about February last year, I was like, hmm, she looks a little rounder than normal to me. And so I had no idea when she was going to be born, but they live in a dry lot um, up by my barn because um, parcel can't really be on grass and um, Fabio gets special food and it's just, so we kept watching her and watching her and watching her. And of course, I was at a horse show when the foal was born. And my my vacation barn help person called me. And I, I think I was in either Illinois or Kentucky or something. And she's like, it's pouring down rain here. Should I bring this mare and foal in? And I'm like, yes, please bring them in. So she had this big dramatic birth thing where she was freezing in the rain. Everybody's worried she... <laughs> Oh, Pony survive. <laughs> so she had a little bit of a drama. So when I got home, I think this was Monday or Tuesday after I got, she was born on like a Saturday, I decided to put her right on the pads and. Okay. Oh, hang on. I've gotten. All right. So, so she was, you were away. She was born. You got home. She had a rough start and, and then I, I'll get this video playing here. Let me see if I can, I don't know why I can't. Oh, that's interesting. She does a shake off. She shakes all the time to this day with any kind of, um, if, if she's had a really good experience, she'll shake like, like she's, you know, yeah. Shaking like a dog. Um, if she's had a stressful experience, she'll shake. <laughs> it's her, it's her habit. Wow. That's really interesting. All right. So I'll just play this again. So, so is this the first time she was on the pad? Yeah. And you just guided her over and she's what, three days old, you said? Yeah, like maybe three or four days old. Now she is different than Violet. She was much easier to guide um, and had like kind of already figured out pressure. So if you're, you know, pushing for her to go forward, she just kind of went forward. I didn't, there wasn't a lot of explaining for her. Okay, and then we've got this video, which um, appears a little bit upside down, but this yeah, it goes sideways. Oh, that's her head. I got it. Okay. One forty-six p.m. No, that was my one. Yeah, sorry. It's hard for me to video and yeah, <laughs> manipulate I horses. <laughs> and so her mother is a nervous. Here are our ears. Here's our head. This is our withers. We're looking down at. Yep. You're basically kind of guiding her over there and trying to film at the same time. And trying not to get killed by her mom because her mom is a nervous mother and was not okay with me being in there. 
yeah. So, so that's a bit of a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so, again, she was just on it for you know, seconds. Works so quick. Yep. That's why I don't hold them on it because I figure if it's like one second, that's what they can take. Right. And then let's see, that's older. Hang on. I think I have another, uh, Oh yeah, so now we're gonna go back to these two videos of her a little bit older, but not today. And the thing I want you to look at is, um, I know that you know it's a couple months later, but what was really nice um, is the mom has, this mare has not ever been on the surefoot pads, but she would react as if she was on the pads while her baby was on them. Okay, somebody so, was just saying they had a problem seeing the video. So hopefully everybody can see that it's, uh, I haven't- Do you want me to it. tell you if it's running? Cause it's not running on mine. Yeah, I'm not playing it just yet. I just brought it up. Okay. You should see a full on a soft pad with the muzzle yeah. of the mom right over her withers. Yeah. Okay, so now we'll let this play. And so she's how old here? She's, this is, I think, October of last year. Um, so she's like uh, July, August, September, four months old. And she has learned to pick up her feet at this point and she has not had a halter on yet. But what's fascinating is that you're seeing exactly the same things we see in adult horses. Yep. Eye blinking, the head lowering, the look at the- It's slide. less dramatic than in the adult horses, but yeah, you'll see. Yeah, but just that, that quietness there where she's standing there just sort of introspective. And then, wow. And this is where I thought it was interesting because she goes to go <laughs> and then she pauses like, oh, wait, do I really want to go? And this is pretty typical, instantly goes in nurses. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, so I'll, I'll just play that again for people so that, we, um, so that they can, so there's our eye blinks, our ears coming back, the neck straightening, a little bit of muzzle work, you know, movement. And mom seems much calmer, I mean, right. just in general with you in there. Obviously she's older now, but. Um, yeah, but she's, she's not an easy mom to deal with. So the fact that she's essentially ignoring you and not reactive and... But do you see how the mom keeps dropping her head too? That's what I found really interesting was she's kind of looking around for stuff to eat and um, she got very, she started um, mirroring what the baby was doing. Oh, wow. Right. I had, hadn't even thought about that as a possibility. Yeah. That's one of the things I discovered like recently, cause I didn't, I wasn't really watching the moms. They're starting to mirror what their babies are doing. Well, and that, that would make sense because if you feel like your foal is okay, then you don't have to be on guard. Right, so I feel like it would, it would if you had like a compromised foal and you've got a really upset mare, I mean, I would love, not that I want to have a mare reject a foal, but I would love to have a rejected foal experience and see if, we well, we actually did with um, Kulaz from New Zealand, who I talked about last week. He was a twin foal, and the one the mayor, the mayor accepted, and they, he was rejected, and so they were bottle feeding him two hour, every two hours, and he couldn't even stand up on his own. And then right. we brought the- No, but I mean to try to get the mayor to bond with the foal. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I that's what I'm talking, like, I really think, um, because, what I've been seeing with the mares and the foals is it just changes the dynamic in the stall. Like, I just wonder if you got the mare on pads, the foal on pads, like if everything would kind of settle down when you've got that rejection thing. We haven't had, I mean, I think in my whole lifetime, I've maybe had three mares reject foals. Um, so it's pretty rare for us at least. And so this is another time, obviously. Yeah, this is in the same session, but um, like the, the next time. I don't, I don't repeat it a lot with the foals because again, I am worried about over. Over, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't like overhandling the babies. 
But you can see that sway right there. She sways a little off and then she comes back on. And then when she moves her head, she comes over that leg a little more. There's our eye blinks. And, you know, I mean, I've been around foals enough to know that watching a foal stand this long, which is not long, but this long with quietly is very unusual. Yeah. And this is very typical. So, so not, it's not documented, but then what I would do, um, it's a little harder with some of the babies to get to their back feet. They're just a little, you know, they're protective. So they don't really do their back feet great when they're little, but um, I'll keep trying to like every day I'll try a different foot. Um, I, I haven't, I can get babies both front feet on, but I can't, I've not gotten other than on the physio pad, I've not gotten all four feet on different, you know, pads. Well, and clearly it's not necessary. Yeah, I don't think it is. I mean, even if you can only get one front foot on, that's good enough. Right. And, and I think that's a really important message in that, you know, it's really not necessary to do a lot um, right. for very long. All right, so now the next one is um, the one where you're in the, hang on, let me see if it's the one with you in the barn aisle or if these are, yeah. Do, do, do. I'm just making sure that we've gone through everything. Okay. Do, do, do. All right, so I think this is the next one. This is where we may be out of order because I sent you that test. The first one is the test video I sent yesterday. Oh, um, wait a second. Let me see if I can dig that up because that didn't get into this file, I don't think. Do you, you don't happen to know the number off the top of your head, do you? Um, it might be 4437. But it's okay, if they're out of order, we can. Well, I, I come to think of it, I'm not sure that I got that. Oh yeah, oh no, I've got it, 4437, okay. Do share screen. Four, four, three, seven. Here we go. Okay, this is that same full, but a year later. Which is pretty impressive. And excuse my Jack Russell for running in and out of the. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn the sound off so that you can just tell yeah. us what, what's going on here. So if this is that, so let me first explain, she's never been tied before. So this is the first time she's been tied, which is really, um, I don't like to fast tie babies the first time, but I wanted to shoot this video and I didn't want to have to goof around. So I was actually really surprised um, at how good she was, which I really do credit for the surefoot because I've never tried to fast tie a baby the first time ever. <laughs> So this was just to see um, how she's picking, how easy it is to pick up her feet. And she pretty consistently on that left hind um, forever, she sticks it to the ground. You have to kind of take it out sideways and then she'll bend her hock. Um, and now so you don't realize how, how little she is to, you stand up and walk around her and how tall are you best because you're not tall. I'm like five feet tall. <laughs> right. So just for everybody's perspective, if I'm Beth tiny. is only five feet tall, this is a tiny pony. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, and then you see how quickly she picked up that other back foot. I know she's moving around, but this is pretty typical of how we've been since she started getting trimmed. Um, so the reason I have the rope draped over her is if she did start to pull back, I could have a little control and just grab that rope. Right. Um, okay. And then my, my, um, I know that you had talked in one of your previous webinars about finding a foot that they post off of, that they balance off of, mm -hmm. um, which I found interesting because I hadn't been thinking of that left hind that way, that she was uh -huh. balancing. Do you know what I mean? Like I was thinking of it as a resistance more than as a, a necessary thing that she needed. Um, so what I wanted to do just as an experiment was then take um, the physio pad and put it under that left hind. She likes the physio pad right now is her other thing. Um, and I'm working with her. So she got weaned, she got weaned late. She got weaned like in April or May. Um, and so yeah, she, comes, she, she really has to think about her balance there to give you that foot. And she's right. not sure about shifting into her front end. 
Right. And so um, she's, she gets brought in and out twice a day for food. Um, she's had, she has had her bridal path clipped several times. She goes on walks with me. Um, so now she's like working on tying. She goes up to the indoor arena to work on obstacles. Like, and she might get worked maybe once or twice a week and then maybe have a week off. I don't, I really don't do, I do daily handling. She gets groomed, you know, but we don't do a lot of quote unquote training because it's more about making her okay with being around us. Um, so and then she, when I, how old here again, just to refresh. She's a yearling. Right. So she's one. She turned one in June. I mean, June, like two weeks ago. So what's really interesting, and I just want to play this one more time, because A, this is the first time this foal has ever been tied, and she's not even really she's not pulling. questioning that at all. <laughs> and B, what, I'm going to just pause this and take this forward. When you go to pick up that right front what you can see is she is searching for hey, her. I have the same shirt on, I'm just noticing. <laughs> That's okay. I'm sure it got laundered in between. It did. Right? So here you can see she shifts back, shifts back more, right? She's trying to figure this out, picks up the foot, comes forward, shifts back. When I mean, you can see this forward and back motion, and then she can settle a little more into that right front. Right? And I'm gonna skip the left hind for a second. I'm gonna come around to where you do the right front. Uh -huh. Okay, and watch how she can stabilize laterally on the left side. So you pick up the right front, but you see how, how solid she is on the left side, left front, left hind. And we don't see that shifting back and forth, right? I mean, it's just an interesting observation. And then there so she shifts a tiny bit. So here's an interesting observation that, uh, so I'm, as you're saying that, um, her current thing, she doesn't really like having both front feet or both back feet on pads. She wants the front left and the rear left or the front right and the rear right. Laterally. Side, laterally. Yeah, side to side. That's her thing right now. Well, and that I doesn't really... surprise me just watching how, she, how she's, organizing to pick up her feet. Yeah, she, and I just go with it. I actually don't ever analyze like, why, why are we doing this now? I just go, okay, this is what they want today. And you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I think that's really important that you're not analyzing it. You're simply observing it and kind of filing that data away. But it, you know, in just that brief moment of that video, it became so apparent to me that she's, she's really stable laterally left and when you take away that stability, she's not sure. So I'm wondering, um, just, just as an experiment, if you started on her right side, picking up her feet, and I know you did this for the video, you did this yeah. for two days, but started on the right side and offered her the physio pad on the, on the right when you went to the left, um, just to see, because- Oh, yeah. And it may be that she's just going through a, a growth spurt right now too, you know, as they do. Um, and maybe there's, you know, she's just sorting something out. But, but you know, overall, that was, that's quite impressive, I have to say. <laughs> well, and I never, if we hadn't done this video, I never would have tried just to tie her. Like, I would never have figured out, like, I, and it was, that was kind of an aha. I was like, oh, she may explode and pull back and we may have to shoot this over again. But she never did, so. Right, but she was uh, willing to. To me, like, that's, that's a balance. Awesome. It's kind of impressive. <laughs> yeah, she's balanced enough that she doesn't have to pull back on the rope and scare herself. Like, well, and you have to wonder how many horses, when that happens, it really is a, a, a balance issue, that they don't know yeah. how to balance without being able to position their 40-pound head on an adult horse. Where Correct. They to, to counter whatever's happening in their body that's causing an instability. And when we take that away from them, then they panic that, you know, like I can't put my head where I need to put it because it's fixed to this place. And how do I rearrange my body so I can feel secure? Right. Right. And she's one. So her, her little anxiety move, I don't know what else to call it. Is she'll come right up with her um, pole and you can kind of see where her neck joins into her shoulder. She's real, you know, not formed well, you know, she's, has no muscle. Right. Um, so, she, so she grabs with like the bottom of her neck. Um, 
And that's one of the things I'm working on successfully is getting her to drop that pole and use her top line better with the, through using the Surefoot pads. And again, this is that same day when you, it's her first time being tied. Yep, and this is the first time on these blue pads. Well, from, I mean, obviously as a baby, she was on them, but I haven't been using them recently, so. And your helper there. Yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> that's fine, you know. I mean, that's so, life, right? And yeah, the other so, thing I want. How she had to, she had to reorganize right. to pick up that foot, and then she felt the instability of the soft pad, and that's why that right foot had to. But what I liked about that when I rewatched this video is she didn't come up with her head. She kind of like dove forward with it differently. And the other thing I want to say about working alone with the sure foot pads is um, I don't cross tie. I hate cross tying, number one, but I do tie to these posts, but I try to get them off that tie as quickly as I can. Right. Um, I don't like them to be tied with the pads. Right. I, I agree with you as, as, as often as mo more that we can, the, because it's, a, it's about allowing them to have the freedom of the head to move the head and especially downward. And right. if, they're, if they're tied, they don't have that option um, or it's, it's reduced. Um, and you know, I, it always takes me back to my Feldenkrais training where you know, you'd be laying on the floor and somebody would have their shoes in your space. And even if it wasn't at your, you know, on your blanket, if it was near your blanket, you felt confined. And it doesn't take much to, to feel confined when we're really starting to pay attention. It's, right. it's, it's kind of fascinating. So it, she does have a little tiny bit of startle in there too, like when yeah. she the pad. And I'm actually, so her startle used to be to rush backwards. Um, and we've actually been working on that the last two months to stop and think instead of just like if the manure spreader position changed, she would freak out. Like it was just like, as soon as I realized she was doing like this behavior of rushing back. So again, never being tied before and then to have her not hit that rope and pull when something startled her is like a huge Well, success. and that was so interesting because I'm just going to back that up a little bit. Like she's, and this is something that I always try to help point out to people of, you know, when you have a bit of a startle reflex and here, what you can see is there is a startle reflex, but it's so attenuated, like right there, look at the ear. And then I'm just going to stop right. that and take that back. So this is like a one on a scale of one to 10 in terms of re reaction but you can see that that that's in there, but how much it's reduced, right? And, I and think reduced in two months. Well, so if she got weaned in like April, so yeah, two or three months, we've taken it from rushing backwards, dragging you across the barn to that. Yeah. Without like, I'm, I'm basically just doing surefoot and waiting, <laughs> you know, for her not to, you know, do her her dramatic response right you're not responding to it you're just offering her an op opportunity to not have to like you know how some of the some of the trainers say get their feet busy when right. when they do that like i don't do that i just kind of wait it out and um and like no. I said, like the surefoot pads are worked into my everyday, like, so she'll come in, she'll stand on pads for a minute, she'll eat her grain, we'll stand on pads for a minute, we'll go back outside. Like, but that's her here, day. She comes around, I, I think she does, I think she just licks and chews as she looks back yeah, at the she pad. Does. right there, she licks yeah. and chews. So, you know, what, what we've got here is this conflict between, oh, I like the comfort, and oh, I think I need to be startled. And, you know, comfort's always going to win, it's just a, you know, have it helping her feel that experience and making the connections between that thing that I thought was something to worry about actually is something that brings me comfort. Um, and, you know, th this is fabulous to, to watch, Beth, because um, on so many levels to see, you know, from a foal that had a really difficult uh, birthing and how you're just working it through. But I agree with you of about you know and there she she blew her nose and sneezed. yeah um because 
you know, if we, if we distract them, if we make their feet busy and distract them from the thing that just happened, we don't give the nervous system a chance to process and come to a conclusion that it's okay. What right. we do is we put them in the conclusion that they must flee and by moving their feet, they're fleeing. So, so we're actually, in my opinion, I think that's a conflict in terms of what it is we want to accomplish in the nervous system, which is to be able to have an experience of discomfort of, I'm not sure that I'm safe, I'm not sure this is okay, and then be able to, to remain in that till the nervous system calms down so the conclusion is, I'm actually okay. But if we move them, we're saying, run away. And so we're not actually shifting the nervous system to um, a, a pattern of learning and acknowledgement and reprogramming. We're actually just feeding into the flight reflex. Right. You're not teaching them to be critical thinkers. Right. You're just teaching them flee and you're going to flee by moving, you know, and, and movement is movement. Believe me, you know, when I was a kid, I used to like get on my bike and ride for hours and then I got my horse and I rode for, I rode his shoes off. You know, fleeing is fleeing, whether it's a right. bike or whatever. Um, but this idea of letting them process that information and, um, and have and I, the, for for me as a trainer, that's what the surefoot pads have changed for me is I'm kind of watching to see if they're processing information. That's what I'm looking for now. I'm not really looking for, did they gain the skill of walking over the bridge? I'm watching for how she's gaining the skill to walk over the bridge. It's a, it's a different way for me, at least, of training horses. It's, it's less end result and more, um, I don't know if you wanna call it whole brain. Like I'm interested in what her whole brain is doing and not just accomplishing the goal of walking over the bridge or the pole or you know whatever I'm doing with these babies, tying. Right, you're, you're, um, there's got to be a good way to phrase that up. Yeah. Um, but this, the focus has shifted from the task itself to the processing of a task, to the ability yeah. to, to process and integrate information, to assimilate information, and to come to a place of conclusion that I'm okay, so that whatever that experience is doesn't require an adverse reaction of flight, fight, freeze, faint, fool around. Correct. And it goes faster. The whole training, um, she was having trouble. You have to do a little step over to get into my indoor arena. And she really struggled with that the first three or four times in. And I said to my daughter, I said, film me coming in the indoor and maybe she'll do that. We she does this weird four-legged, all four feet, hit the ground and jump sort of simultaneously. I can't even explain it. And she hadn't been up to the indoor in like three weeks. And I thought, well, maybe she'll do it. And then we can see, you know, how how I trained them to walk through the door and she didn't do it. She just walked like a normal horse into the door. <laughs> but that speaks so much the information. to the of time that, you know, it's with the babies, it, it's, well, and actually even with the older horses, it's dosing it and then letting them rest and process. And, you know, I keep going back to Al, my horse, that I would, I started working on counter canner and then I had to go away for, I don't know, six weeks, a couple of months or whatever. And I came back and I got back on it. The very first thing he wanted to do was show me that he figured out counter canner. Look, mom. Yeah. I got, I was like, well, really, I want, okay, we're going to go with this because he was, he was like, I figured it out. <laughs> um, so this video is actually um, nine minutes long. And I think what we'll do best is um, I'll just kind of scroll. Hopefully I won't make anybody nauseous. <laughs> it forward a little bit but you know it's just really interesting to see that she's curious about the pads she's licking and chewing just from touching the pads yeah. right she's a lit yeah you can see a little bit of that um i think i'm i want to leave i'm not sure you know a little bit of tail swishing but this co this combination of licking and chewing dopamine processing and um and and swishing so you can see this conflict in her nervous system between the two two um uh, different outcomes, right? I got to go. I really want to stay. Um, but we know that that feeling good wins in the end. And so she's so cute. All right. So tell <laughs> us what you're doing here. So um, I usually just start them over poles and I, she's had a lot of trouble with the poles. 
and she likes them spaced further apart to start out with. So we've been doing that. This, this isn't since April because I don't really start taking them up to the indoor until they're weaned. Um, so I just wanted to show, and I thought she'd have trouble with the two that are closer together. And she, again, she hasn't worked on this in a couple, and like, that was just like a normal, yeah. what you would expect. And she's had so much trouble with that. And I couldn't, I was just astonished that she walked through it so easily the first time after not having been up there in a couple of weeks. And this is the thing I just really love is I'm not having to put in hour and hour. And you see this time she dropped her nose all the way yeah. through. Line from the top line. I loved it. Like, I was so like, what oh, did you do in the previous sessions to work on the poles when it was more of an issue? Oh, okay. So what I usually do, so what she was doing with the two poles close together, which, you know, first she tried to jump them, you know, all at once. Then she, you know, kind of did this weird, this weird thing that I can't even describe that she does with her feet where she has two feet on the ground and two feet in the air and like they're not diagonal pairs. <laughs> Um, she's very tricky that way. I put the pads down in front of the pole so okay. that she steps on the pad and then we don't walk over the poles, we walk off the pad. She gets to kind of pick wherever she wants to go. And then just pretty quickly, she started walking over the poles. So you so just, you just how we talked about horses in the in prior to where she might have a weird reaction. And then and then made it not about the pole, but just about, hey, there's a pad here and you can walk off wherever you want. Right. So this bridge thing, this is how I train horses to go over bridges. Um, they kind of get to pick if they want to put their feet on or not. And then in the second session, if they're not walking on it, um, then we'll have some you know, poles on the side or, and I've got the poles so she can walk in between the bridge and the poles. Um, so she has an, what I call an escape route. Yep. And it's interesting because some of them, um, I try not to trap them. So I don't put myself, I, I'm on, my leading side is against the wall. So she can choose not to go on. So this is about the distance away from any obstacle that I start with the pad. because she's already been on the pad. So this is just kind of to get her brain like back into that, that mode. And <laughs> she's, so she's got a little anxiety. <laughs> yeah, but that's so, you know, it's very apparent that, you know, the conflict between the anxiety and the comfort, but she chose comfort. Right. And then I don't hear that she's only got one foot on, like I'm yeah. fine with that. Well, you've got she a lift too, you've got your dopamine hit. There was a tail swish. She processed a piece of information. And see, I love when they put their head down and sniff at things. Like to me, that's that's a huge success, whether or not she easily easily comes up on the bridge. And I can see you have like a, a, just a tiny bit of tension on the lead to ask, but not to make. Yeah. Well, you have to ask. Yes, because you, you have to ask. To be a request in there somewhere, right? And and sometimes my ask is a little bit louder because I'm testing. You know, if she did a big blow up and went backwards from a big ask, I would totally change my approach. But, okay, you know, but we're, we're back to this idea that, you know, you, you, um, the, the horses do need to learn to come forward from a request. Yeah. Um, so many horses, the adverse reaction and that we don't, we buy into it, but you know, that's a, anyway, that's a whole nother story. But yes, it's, you can see that you ask, and, but you're listening to her response. It's not, a, you have to, right? It's just a. Like so there. in a minute here, um, we get into what, what I call like sort of a habit pattern. And I don't know, I just kind of sense sometimes as a trainer, okay, now I got to change this, like what, what we're doing, because she's kind of um, not that she's taking advantage of the situation, but she's developed a pattern of like behavior with the obstacle. So now she's I, never been on this bridge before, correct? Never, never. So this no, is, in, we've been watching for about two minutes if, and, yeah. and in two minutes. Oh, if, I was 
doing this way faster than I normally would. That we would not be going through these steps this fast. So I think this is, is this where I change? I change and bring her from the other way because I didn't kind of like the way she was starting to have a habit of um, avoiding. And so I just wanted to change her thinking about it. So I changed the direction, but it may be the next time through. And now the physio pad's closer to the bridge. But you know, when you think about it, with a, with a yearling foal, um, in, in about three minutes, she's actually putting herself on the bridge because you're not forcing her onto it. You're asking her, but you're not forcing. She's figuring it out. And you can see, I, you know what I would love to do if you're okay with it? I'd love to show this video to Sharon Wilsey in our next yeah. webinar. Oh, I would love to. I think that would be so fascinating to, to listen to Sharon um, uh, give us feedback on her body language um, and what she's, you know, interpreting, right? Because I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, this pony, so Violet, um, one of the reasons I have so many pictures and videos of these two is I'm keeping them and as family horses. Um, so yeah, like I'm gonna do things a little bit differently <laughs> with these guys. <laughs> um, is this where I change direction? Yeah, so this is where I change direction because I don't want her to start lifting that pole. That is the habit I do not want to encourage. Not the pole. Not the pole. That was what she was starting. So see how different this is? She was like, oh, uh, okay, I just got to get through it. But <laughs> right. But then you get the different. look and chew. She did, you know, and, and you see her really, oh, so cute. <laughs> she, you know, she is really trying to, to figure this out. Especially, I, you know, I just have to reiterate, this is the first time she has ever seen this. She's a yearling. And yeah. we've already seen that the, there's um, nervous system patterns that she's had, like the neck raising. But how quickly she's, oh, how cute. Um, <laughs> can I have my pad back? I'm like, yes, you can. <laughs> now, have you ever put it on top of the bridge? I haven't. I would, that would be the next Thing that I would do some one um, some of them they get nervous about putting their foot up on the pad on the bridge so usually I get it really close to the bridge and then um, if I have one that won't put their back feet on I put the front feet on the pad on the bridge and then usually we don't have a problem with it well and what a great way to prepare them to go in a trailer now, how lovely is this wow. right <laughs> <laughs> and again, just to reiterate, you know, best would be breaking this down into smaller segments of yeah. and slower, but, you know, she did this for us for a video so that we could see the, the, the steps in the process. And also just to realize, wow. And I let her walk off. There is no, you must stay on the bridge. No, and actually, however she wants to ways, do it. You know, that allowing her to, if you will, fall off the side of the bridge. And I, Watching that, and let me see if I can just back that up because I think this is the lateral pattern that you're actually experiencing. Oh, interesting, right. Right, so I'm just gonna let it play forward again, but I think it's the lateral pattern of left, left. Okay, so here she's stepped on, right? And her head is to the left, so she's put her head weight over her left front. And you see how she kind oh, of, yeah. she just does this funny little like, oops, I'm not coordinated. I mean, it's really to me a, like, See that she actually crosses she her crosses. Right front over her left front, right? And so that's why she, but she's got her left hind in the air. So, you know, when you look at the pattern here, I'll just do it again, because I think this is fascinating. And I think if you look at if and when her lateral pattern of the pads changes, you may see a change in, in this as well, right? So she steps yeah. up, look at the big step she takes, really big, and her right eye is on the pad, right? Oh, sorry, that was her left front. And then she puts her left front down and her left hind's on the ground. And then here's her left hind coming up, right? And she literally crossed her legs over. So, you know, there's a degree of something going on here. I can't even tell you what. But well, and that's, that's the thing I'm seeing, like, when she's going over the little step in to get into the indoor. 
and the poles not being able to coordinate properly through the poles. Like um, it, it's it's all kind of connected. It's related. Same. All related. But but the other piece about allowing her to walk off the side like that and not forcing her is she's going to figure out, wow, that was kind of, you know, like if you, that's uncoordinated. Like when you're starting to learn how to ride a bicycle and you fall over, you're like, wow, well, that wasn't the best idea, but I still want to try it. Right. Right. So we need those trials and errors for our nervous system to learn. I mean, it's important to allow her the, the, the mistake so that she can learn from the mistake. Right. But what's so interesting is that even though she, she stepped off the bridge, sort of fell stepped, I, I would kind of call it, you look at her expression right and she's like okay and then she's got a pole to navigate <laughs> right but she navigates that laterally beautifully look at that right and to the right and then she's really not at all i mean her neck is down she's not stressed or anxious about it right. at all um and so you know it's it's so often that we 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 don't want ourselves to fail with our horses. In other words, we don't want to make mistakes and we so don't want to let the horses make mistakes. But the only way we learn is by making mistakes and then learning the, okay, that didn't work out too good. Let me do it this way, right? Like, you know, cooking, you make a mistake. And so you, you cook, you burn the eggs, you toss them and then you do it again. And maybe you get it right this time or maybe you don't. It takes a couple of times, but um, allowing them the trial and error, that's going to develop their coordination and their nervous system, which is so important because if you just hothouse flower them, they, they don't have the breadth of understanding to cope when something doesn't go quite right. Right. And she's like, so, okay, I made a mistake. I stepped off the side of the bridge. It's like, no big deal. Well, and when you're training, well, I mean, probably really any horse, but for me, when I'm training something to be a children's pony, they have to be able to think quietly through chaos. And so that's sort of at the forefront when I'm training babies is it's just, I'm trying to watch for, okay, how are they going to handle this situation going wrong? Like I don't get to, I don't, that's why I don't worry about how she's going to go across the bridge. Like right. she's just got to figure it out. And pretty soon she figures out the easy way to go across the river. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's that resiliency that we can make a mistake and our world doesn't fall apart. And we just learn from our mistakes and we add to our body of knowledge. And you can so see her so rapidly, as you say, criti critically thinking or, or processing or putting together the ideas. In other words, she's able to comprehend the relationship the pad makes me feel more comfortable and I can then organize to do this thing, maybe not perfectly, but each time. I mean, in, in just, that was a nine minute clip and it wasn't all going over the um, thing that how rapidly she started to figure out the bridge. And I'm sure if you just leave her out in the field for two weeks, she'll come back in next time and walk straight over it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, this has been super fascinating. Um, you know, I, I haven't talked to you. It feels like two years. I know. Because <laughs> you know, you've been building your house, but I didn't know you were tinkering away in your little lab up there with your poles and your ponies. And um, <laughs> I, I'm so glad that you came today on the webinar and presented this because I think that there's so much in this for people, not just for handling foals, but in terms of our pers perspective on training and to shift from the task orientation of you have to accomplish this task to the process orientation of are you are you thinking about and learning about what you're doing right uh, and so you're making them better learners you're building more dendrites you're you know like you're making those everything um, more plentiful so that she can process and figure it out for herself right and that's and what, you know so like with the polls well, and my, my big thing, because, you know, I do watch the Facebook pages and, you know, see what people and every once in a while I'll comment because I don't, I don't really want to get too much into telling people how to use the pads. Um, but you really have to step away from training them to be on the pads, having them on the pads, even if the horse wants to stay on the pads for 10 minutes. I'm not, I have not found that to be you know, the same benefit. I like to get them off the pad, walk, and then come back. I'd rather spend 10 minutes on and off, on and off. 
um, than leave them there for 10 minutes. Like it, to me, the walking them around in between being on the pad is actually more beneficial than the amount of time on the pad. Yeah. Um, just that's been my experience of all the horses that I've been working with recently is letting them get moving and um, then they come back to the pads with a different idea almost. And I, I don't know, I just, yeah, the task of standing on the pads, I would like to see that thought of, instead of just like noticing, you know, how your horse is moving and, you know, what they're thinking off the pads and, you know, yeah, all because of that. The, the purpose here is that we have to go back to the earth. We're not gonna live on pads. We just want right. to gather a little bit of information. And after last night's webinar on proprioceptors, just activate some of those uh, afferent uh, receptors, the ones going to the brain, just to make a change so that it can send back a message to coordinate in a different way. And Correct. it does not require much time at all um, to activate those receptors. And that's, I mean, I have seen horses where literally a quarter of an inch of hoof on a pad for seconds completely shifts the horse into a completely different area of learning and understanding yeah. and responding um, so many times that I just um, thank you for saying that because um, it's important for people to realize it's not quantity of, of standing on pads. It's, it's um, more presentation and then process. Right. Yeah. Cool. Well, this is a new pattern. <laughs> yeah, it's been a blast, Beth. Thank you so much for joining me. It's just uh, been a really fun webinar. And thank you, everybody, for joining me. And just remember, you can find this and all my other webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. If you subscribe, you'll get a notice every time we add a video. Um, I will be continuing. I have guests for, for next week. And I'll be continuing into the beginning of July. And then I'm going um, to go teach for the first time since March. Um, in New Hampshire, and um, but I'm hoping to be able to keep some webinars going during that time. It just depends on my internet connection, and then I will, of course, be continuing the end of July and into August. I've already got some great guests lined up, and I'm working on a few more. So, um, and we're still trying to schedule Bob to come back. I don't know. He's, he just had. Did you get that really bad storm? He, yeah. He, oh, it flooded my new house basement. <laughs> oh. Yeah, because he's lost power and he's, you know, still trying to oh, get the internet. In the middle of the webinar? No, before it started. And so, like, literally, just before it started, um, he lost power. And Dr. Sybil Mole was tuning in to listen to him and was kind enough to fill in and did a wonderful oh. webinar and conditioning at the spur of the moment with her Italian slides, which was fantastic and nobody even noticed. Um, but we're still trying to schedule Bob to come back because there's so much more to learn from Bob. Yes. Yep. So thanks, Beth. And hopefully I'll see you in person sometime in the near yeah. future. Um, we'll if you ever can get me on a plane again. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you were hard to get on a plane before. Now it's going to be- I'm never getting on now. <laughs> I don't know. I guess we'll need a, a driving visit and something. <laughs> well, thanks again. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. For and I'll see you on Monday. I'll be putting out the email. I, I can't even remember who my guest is off the top of my head. Um, if you uh, join the Murdoch Method email list, you go to murdochmethod.com, join the email list. You'll get the email on Sunday for all the links for the upcoming week. And if you are not on the list, you can always go to the Surefoot Equine uh, website and go to the calendar and sign up through the calendar. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me and have a fantastic weekend. I think it's going to be great weather here in Virginia and I'll be spending time with my ponies in my garden. So until next week, I'll see you all again. Thanks, Bess. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you. Bye.